So indeed, I'm going to talk to you about uh, syncope and uh, in the ED and pre-hospital. I know there's a lot of paramedics uh, watching tonight, so um, I'll try and make it very relevant for yourselves as well. Obviously, uh, we all see undifferentiated patients with blackout, so it's equally um, important that we know what to do with them in the pre-hospital situation as well as in the emergency department. Just a few disclosures. These are all related to some research work I do in this area, um, and it's mainly through um, being supplied with monitors. Um, I will mention the Aspired study just at the end, uh, just for a little bit about where we're going in this area. Um, and all, all the research I present is all uh, uh, non-commercial, independently uh, funded research. So John mentioned the beautiful city of Edinburgh. I, I couldn't not start with uh, some pictures of the city, which if you haven't been, is a great place to, to come to. It doesn't always look like this. I can't promise it'll be sunny and beautiful all the time, but uh, certainly certainly worth a weekend. Um, and uh, certainly the surrounding area and, and Scotland is absolutely beautiful. So uh, I thoroughly recommend it. This is why I work. This is the emergency department at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh. So I uh, work as a clinician there, and I also have some research time to promote and support recruitment to our research studies. And we collaborate with colleagues around the UK and also develop our own research portfolio. But I am a, um, primarily a uh, ED clinician and uh, I'm, I'm working clinically uh, for most of my time. And people, people argue about how long that should be. But essentially, the, the point of this is just to, to uh, give you the information about another one. And again, if we see, we see lots of people with potentially long QT on the ECGs, which could be for lots of causes, most commonly noisy ECGs. But if we're considering this, we probably do um, a 24 hour tape and get an average QT if the patient's presented with symptoms that could be compatible with uh, syncope. Uh, cricketer this time, this is uh, James Taylor, an English cricketer who uh, went into his ED uh, after an episode of ventricular tachycardia, and he was diagnosed with ARVC. And this is arrhythmogenic right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy. And this ECG shows a T-wave inversion in leads V1 to 3, which is found in about 85% of patients. And this something called an epsilon wave, which is uh, specific for um, uh, for uh, ARVC and um, can be seen as that little upstroke just after the QRS. Again, not expecting you to remember these, just giving you some uh, examples from some ECGs. Final one, maybe a bit more common. This is Brumada syndrome here showing the downsloping ST depression in leads V1, V2. Uh, with some T-wave inversion. The definitive treatments, an implantable cardio defibrillator and undiagnosed Brugada syndrome. And number five, you need to do some lying standing blood pressures. So it's all about history. And to emphasize this, this is a case report of a 25 year old male who had a transit loss of consciousness during a tandem skydive in New Zealand. So on the face of it, pretty concerning. Uh, exertional, during sporting activity, it's gotta be cardiac, hasn't it? But going into the story, um, they were wearing a uh, chute underneath the, the tandem uh, uh, skydiver. The leg straps were uh, digging into the legs and they had a reduction in venous return. So a classic history for venous pooling and reduced venous return secondary to the leg straps. Luckily, it was tandem, as I said, and I live to tell the tale. And this is me 15 minutes later. Uh, I've got see, much more grey hair now and uh, I had a very impressive trousseau sign. But this demonstrates the importance of a clear history which gives us diagnosis here. And just want to mention this as well, because we just need to think about occupation as well when we are seeing someone who's had a syncopal episode. So what do they do for a living? Are they a skydiver? Clearly that's a, a bad prognostic sign uh, if you are suffering recurrent syncope. Um, 
But think about drivers, for example, do they have a type one or type two DVLA license because the rules are different and just need to think about driving. Other, other risk factors we need to think about when we are taking the history. Syncope during exercise is really important. And again, history is key here. So a um, young girl collapsing while running for a ball, playing hockey is a slam dunk for cardiac cause of syncope. Um, a young girl but we omit more. So that would lead to about 56% being omitted, which is very similar to what we do. So um, the good thing about these syncope decision rules is that they all have aspects to them that are very useful in diagnosing patients. So if we go back to the Canadian score, vasovasal predisposition. So does someone, someone have a good story that it's vasovagal? Um, have they got a history of heart disease? We know that's associated with cardiac disease. Um, have they got an abnormal ECG? We know that's more associated with a cardiac cause. Um, so these are all incorporate things that have probably allowed us, because we're a bit more familiar with them, to know the things to look out for. The ESC guidelines, I'll just touch on uh, very briefly, uh, a few years old now, but they for the first time mention uh, ED management and they have a list of low risk criteria and high risk criteria. and even just um, for looking at this table in the guidelines, uh, I think it's quite useful. It's just on one of the pages in the middle of the guidelines on the ED section. Uh, and just to have a read through that, it tells you all the things associated with low risk syncope and all the things associated with high risk. And then once you have risk stratified the patient, if they have only low risk features, it's likely to be reflex or uh, orthostatic or postural and they're probably safe to be discharged. If they've got any high risk features, then they need to have some kind of assessment, whether they come to hospital, admitted to hospital, get assessment in a clinic or in a syncope decision unit. Um, but certainly if they've just got low risk category features, they're probably safe, they're, they are safe to be discharged. Um, Um, stand still or um, this this might be sort of nodal failure or could just be a very prolonged vagal episode but the the story here of him having no pre-warning is the thing to be concerned about he's had a pacemaker put in since and he's doing really well um, and there's some other evidence suggests that uh, monitoring for periods of time uh, low risk patients for a couple of hours in ED higher risk patients for a couple of weeks or so will um, increase the number of patients we pick up with the arrhythmias. So we could be doing better and we've got some money to do a, a, a big trial across the UK, 30, 40 EDs, uh, where we're putting um, ECG devices on patients for two weeks um, or standard care to see whether this is cost effective and when it reduce, if it reduces the number of episodes people have. We... Uh, started last year and uh, recruited about 700 patients and um, you can see again some of the common things that we've picked up here uh, are pauses so uh, patients uh, having further episodes and there's a 12 second pause there and a four second pause um, which tend to be one of the common things that, that patients have and all of these patients obviously have gone on and had intervention with pacemakers. So that's just a little bit on where things might be going in the future in terms of as well as just risk stratifying patients and uh, diagnosing them as unexplained syncope, um, we might be able to go on and investigate them further from the ED. At the moment, what happens is patients come into hospital. If you're admitting someone to hospital, you really should put them on a monitor because that's your best opportunity to be able to pick up the underlying cause, um, the underlying arrhythmia. And um, to try and get a monitored bed, wired monitored Um, I think the perception is that syncope is difficult to manage. We've discussed uh, how to differentiate it from seizure, which is the other 
um, common uh, presenting symptom that is bracketed under transient loss of consciousness. We've talked about why it can be difficult. I've hopefully reassured you that bad outcome isn't quite as bad uh, as it used to be thought. Um, but there are is there is some significant disease out there in terms of patients having cardiac arrhythmias. So we need to be thinking, is it syncope first? Is there an underlying cause? And if not, could the patient possibly have high risk features for cardiac cause? And if they do, we need to make sure that they have some timely follow up, um, whether that's admitting them hospital or to a suitable clinic where they can be seen uh, fairly soon by someone who is experienced at managing syncope. And uh, we need to think about driving for everyone that we've seen in the ED, if they've got a, a, a condition that might affect their ability to drive. And I've talked a little bit about some of the work we're doing on uh, early monitoring of these patients to pick up cardiac causes.